Good afternoon and welcome to ICE Webinars, a cool place for hot topics. Today we are joined by KA Images founder and CTO Kareem S. Kareem and application specialist Jay Petitio. ICE Webinars would like to thank today's sponsor, KA Imaging. A spin-off from the University of Waterloo, KA Imaging specializes in developing innovative X-ray imaging technologies and systems, providing solutions to the medical, veterinary, and non-destructive test industrial markets. For more information, visit kaimaging.com. Just a quick reminder that ICE Magazine is headed to ICE 2023 at the Renaissance Nashville Hotel in Tennessee from February the 17th to the 19th. The Imaging Conference and Expo is the only conference dedicated to imaging directors, radiology administrators, and imaging engineers. ICE offers valuable CE credits from the ASRT and ACI and is a unique community of key decision makers and influential imaging professionals. Registration is now open, so for more details, please visit attendice.com. Today's webinar is eligible for one AARRT Category A CE credit from the AHRA. You can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll wrap up today's presentation with a live Q&A, so please submit any questions anytime using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. Okay, let's kick off today's webinar by giving away one of our brand new ice gym bags to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. Which president made Thanksgiving a permanent national holiday? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard and I'll reveal the answer at the end of the webinar. As I mentioned earlier, our presenters today are Kareem Kareem and Jay Paticho, who will be discussing better point of care and bedside imaging with spectral DR technology, optimizing clinical and operation outcomes. Kareem, you may begin whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. And welcome to uh, all of you who've uh, logged in here. So we're going to talk about better point of care and bedside imaging with spectral DR technology and specifically optimizing for clinical and operational outcomes. Our learning objectives today are to understand how dual energy subtraction X-ray works, what are the limitations of older generation dual exposure, dual energy subtraction techniques, and how a single exposure technique detector can overcome these limitations. We're also going to look at some clinical benefits that are enabled by single exposure dual energy, um, including the early detections of nodules, pneumonia, pneumothorax, coronary calcium. We're going to look at some current implementations of single exposure dual energy, especially in the portable and mobile space, something that's never been done before. And then we'll conclude with the uh, operational and economic benefits that could be realized by using uh, dual energy exposure, um, dual energy subtraction. So X-ray has been around for quite a while, over 120 years. And on the slide here, you can see what Ronkin's first X-ray looked like and what today's um, X-ray looks like. In terms of image quality, today's X-ray is significantly better. But in terms of information content, um, that is, what can I diagnose with what's current versus what I could back in the day, and the answer is not much more. The information content has largely remained the same. Now, you're all familiar with this, so this is a little bit of a review, but X-ray systems, you see them in two different flavors. You see them in fixed rooms and you see them in mobiles. In the fixed room, it's exactly that, it's fixed. You've got a wall stand, you've got a table, an X-ray source, and the detector is that object the lady is holding. In the mobile, it's largely similar, except everything is on wheels. You've got a cart, you've got the X-ray source with a collimator, and then you've got the detector that is placed in the cart. So in, in the mobile case, the, the device goes to the patient, in the fixed case, the patient comes through the device. X-ray is a widely, widely used procedure. It's a workhorse of uh, hospitals and the medical imaging business. 
2, million, 2 billion procedures are taken annually and 60% of all medical imaging is based on x-ray. When you talk about x-ray specifically, you're saying maybe about 40% of x-ray is chest, 25% um, is spine, and then you've got a little bit in extremity, pelvis, um, and other features. But chest and spine usually drive most of x-ray, at least in terms of volume. Now, x-ray is a workhorse. It's obviously being used today. People can get away from it, primarily because it's so accessible and so inexpensive and doesn't require um, very specialized knowledge to operate. But there are reasons why x-ray is not very good, and that's the reason why we have follow-on imaging. Some of the problems with x-ray include um, being able to identify soft tissue or being able to differentiate tissues. On the image that's shown on your screen, you have a chest x-ray. In the chest x-ray, the orange circle is placed around a nodule, something that looks very regular. You couldn't say with certainty if that's calcified or not. If you look a little bit south and a bit to the east, you can see there, are, there is another nodule there as well, and potentially more near the mediastinum. The problem is, of course, with regular x-ray, you can't say conclusively if this is a granuloma or if this is something more serious. And so you have to go on for some kind of follow-up imaging like a CT. The other problem with x-ray, and this is in particular related to bedside x-ray, is that the image quality is not very good. The reason why the image quality is not good is because you don't have the benefits of perfect alignment and a fixed geometry system, which allow you to be able to use good image processing and whatnot. So image quality is notoriously bad, and portable x-ray, which is primarily used to find things like the tips of lines and tubes, or pneumothorax or pneumonia in the intensive care unit, or even foreign bodies in the surgical unit, you can't really see them too well. So that's a, so that's a limitation. And then lastly, lateral x-rays are quite important, especially at getting at stuff behind the heart. But you run into the exact same problem that you run into with original PA x-ray, because you can't separate tissue. You can't separate soft tissue from bone. So chest x-ray, for example, often misses disease in the retrocardiac space, such as masses that overlap uh, joints, and also things like coronary calcium, tuberculosis, and so on and so forth. So these are the shortcomings of x-ray. And now what we'll talk about is dual energy x-ray, is the next generation of x-ray that has actually overcome some of those clinical challenges. But to understand dual energy x-ray, we have to spend a little bit of time on what exactly regular x-ray is uh, and how it works. So with a regular x-ray, you've got an x-ray source, a point source that generates an x-ray beam. You've got your patient that's right there, and then you've got the x-ray detector. The x-ray detector has two components inside, a scintillator that converts the x-ray into light, and then a TFT pixel array, which is nothing more than a giant camera, that takes the light and converts it into an electronic signal. That signal is then digitized, ergo it's called digital x-ray, and you're able to see the image. If you go just a little bit granular, the x-ray source is not actually a monoenergetic source, it's actually polychromatic. So you have a spectrum that spans low to high energies, just as is shown on the figure on the left. In the human body, the two major materials in the chest would be soft tissue and bone, and they have a different attenuation at the different X-ray energies in the spectrum. And lastly, the detector does not have a constant response to any energy. It also has a varying response depending upon the X-ray energy. So you have to take all three of these processes into account when you get an image from the digital X-ray. This adds a bunch of uh, complications, even in, even in regular X-ray image processing. Now, dual energy was kind of observed about 40 years ago. It was a realization that different X-ray energies have different attenuation coefficients for different materials. For example, soft tissue is pretty transparent, so that attenuation coefficient is, is pretty low, doesn't attenuate much. Bone is not as transparent, it attenuates more, 
And iodine, of course, is not very transparent at all, so it attenuates quite a bit. The point is, if you could take a single energy, like say at 60 kV, and you would see that there is a different attenuation coefficient between bone and soft tissue, and if you were to look at 120 kV, you can notice that the attenuation coefficients are much closer together. This difference in information allows you to perform material discrimination. So how does that happen? You take a low energy image, say at 60 kVp, and then you take a high energy image, say at 120 kVp, and you perform a weighted logarithmic subtraction, a very simple algorithm that literally subtracts one image from the other, but using a specialty weight. By choosing the weight correctly as the ratio of the attenuation coefficients, you can isolate soft tissue and you can isolate bone tissue. So the beauty of dual energy is that not only does it give you a regular X-ray image, it also gives you material information in terms of soft tissue and bone tissue. The advantage then of dual energy is quite uh, obvious. Um, you get early disease detection because you can, uh, you have more information now to make your decision on, and that leads to uh, better outcomes because uh, it shortens the time to providing any kind of procedure or treatment. There's additional safety because dual energy uses less radiation than a CT, obviously because it's uh, more accurate and, and, and better visualization. You get a reduction in diagnostic error and malpractice. You also get improvement in operating efficiencies because now clinicians across a variety of uh, uh, disciplines, radiologists, internists, ICU, ER, residents, students, all of them get a little bump in their diagnostic ability and the ones who know the least get the best improvements. And then lastly, of course, it's cheaper than a CT. So it could be a great alternative to a regular X-ray as a frontline tool, imaging tool. But the big question is why is dual energy not widely used and or adopted today? Because it's not actually widely adopted. And the reason is very simple. Technology development has actually lagged um, the use cases and the demand. And the problem with today's technology is that you need two x-rays in order to do dual energy. So with two x-rays, um, you need extra radiation per scan, and that reduces the amount of use you can get in a hospital because two x-rays is not the same as one x-ray. Moreover, existing dual energy systems are not portable. So they can't substitute regular chest x-ray in a hospital. They have to be something else. Quality is also a concern for many dual energy solutions. Um, when you take two x-rays, they are separated in time. Um, given that your patient is breathing or the heart is beating, you end up getting these motion artifacts which manifest themselves as streaks in the image. And this can render an image unusable. The regular x-ray is fine, but the dual energy image is useless, which begs the question, why did we give the patient two x-ray images or two x-ray exposures? And the last piece is cost. Of course, uh, there are limited options today for fixed systems and there are large upfront costs associated with these dual energy systems because they're usually premium. So dual energy solutions to date have seen slow adoption because of poor image quality, higher radiation, changed workflow, changed clinical technique, and obviously expensive systems. Now, if we take a little walk down memory lane, we can get, a, we can get a, an insight into the history of dual energy. Back in the 90s, the first commercial dual energy systems actually used a two-layer um, CR stack. So there was a top X-ray sensitive layer and a bottom X-ray sensitive layer, and in the middle of those two layers, a piece of copper was introduced. The idea was that a single X-ray exposure some of it was, would absorb in the top layer, usually the low energy. Some of it would absorb in the mid filter, the middle energy, and a little bit would absorb in the bottom layer, the high energy. Now that we've been able to separate low energy from high energy, you could perform the subtraction and get dual energy. The problem with this solution was that you lost half the photons in that copper mid filter. So the dose efficiency was terrible, and the dual energy image quality, you were constantly trading off against a regular X-ray image. Either you could get a good X-ray image or you could get good dual energy images, but you couldn't get both simultaneously. So this idea did not last. And in fact, the systems were taken off the market maybe more than a decade ago. 
KV switching or, or filter switching is what came out next, and this requires two X-ray images. The problems were, as I mentioned earlier, two X-ray exposures leads to motion artifact, additional X-ray exposure to the patient, um, lack of portability, and so and you also always need a grid, which means your dose exposure is always going to be higher, even for smaller patients and even for children. So dose efficiency is marginal and the dual energy image quality is affected by the motion artifact. One in five images is essentially un unusable um, because of the seriousness of the motion artifact. <clears throat> if you try to get rid of the motion artifact, you end up getting some kind of blurring. So that brings us to one of the more recent additions to dual energy, which isn't really dual energy, it's software. It's called bone suppression software. It's an algorithm. It identifies the shape of the bones on an X-ray and tries to hide them and fill in the detail. That software does not actually give you the benefit of dual energy, i.e. you cannot tell if something is calcified or if something is soft tissue. You don't have that ability to, dis to, to discriminate between materials but you can get better visualization by hiding the bones. There are some limited use cases like uh, for nodules and limited views, for example, PA or AP, but um, it, it's not a dual energy solution and it doesn't give you that additional information that could be so powerful, for example, that it might uh, help you save follow-on imaging. You still need to do follow-on imaging with this type of solution. Now, the newest innovation in the dual energy space is a triple layer detector technology. The idea here is it goes back to the basics, like the two layer detector you saw, but it fixes the problem of the mid filter by replacing the mid filter with, this, with a third detector layer. So you have a three layer detector with no filters in the middle. And the advantage here is that you can sum the signal from the three layers to get a regular X-ray image with very high um, dose efficiency and quality or you can subtract the image from the top and the bottom layer and get your dual energy images. So the advantage here is that you get very high dose efficiency, but you also get excellent dual energy image quality. For once, the trade-off between the X-ray image and dual energy image has been broken. How do these layers work? It's very simple. The top layer absorbs the early part of the X-ray, the low energy stuff. The middle layer takes the middle part and the bottom layer takes the high energy stuff. So for Take, for example, a 120 kV X-ray. It doesn't have to be 120. It could be 90 or 80, whatever you wish, depending on your technique. The thicknesses are optimized for the best spectral separation, and the X-ray signals are, 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 are added to give the DR image or subtracted to give the dual energy images. And most importantly, because all three images are acquired simultaneously, there's no motion artifact. So just going back to the dose advantage, the DQE advantage, as I mentioned, um, take a look, for example, at this curve. The orange line is what a typical digital X-ray detector would look like. The blue line is what the dual energy, the, the triple layer dual energy detector looks like. You see a 20 to 30% improvement in dose efficiency. DQE stands for um, detective quantum efficiency or alternately dose efficiency. So the idea or the value of this technique is you're not changing your workflow, you're not changing your clinical technique, you're not even changing the dose to the patient. If anything, you're reducing the dose to the patient, but you're getting dual energy images as a bonus with your regular X-ray. So what's the value of this type of solution? Because it's contained entirely within a detector, it can be integrated into a DR room or a mobile system, and maintaining the accessibility and affordability of those units, the X-ray units, you start to get diagnostic accuracies approaching CT. And in some cases, you can actually reduce the number of CTs you need to do, or at the very least, optimize the amount of CTs you need to do. So you're only doing the CTs that you really need um, and not unnecessarily. This is particularly important in situations where the patient cannot be moved, such as in the ICU, or in situations where the emergency department is backlogged for CT because of a high volume of patients. Um, on the right-hand side, you see some AP images taken with this dual energy device. We'll see more of these um, with Jay in a bit. So just to kind of summarize this section, qualitatively, if we were to compare um, the pros and cons, 
the dual energy or multi-exposure solution, the older generation, is capable of spectral separation but has many problems like motion artifact, sources, the source is, uh, is a KV switching source, you have extra radiation for the patient, and it's only for fixed systems. The single exposure dual layer detector never really took off because it required new clinical use protocols and extra radiation. So it just wasn't a viable solution. But the triple layer detector is, is able to solve all of those older generation problems. No motion artifacts, existing source, existing dose, existing techniques, portability. It costs a little bit more than a regular X-ray detector, but it's so much less than the dual exposure um, type systems, the premium systems. And uh, over time, we've started to call dual exposure, dual energy systems a new name. We call it spectral DR. The reason we say spectral DR is because this is a solution that overcomes the challenges of dual energy. So in this case, dual energy can, for the first time, be used for fixed and mobile applications. You can get three images in a single shot, a regular X-ray, a bone tissue, and a soft tissue no motion artifacts in any of the images, um, full, full compatibility with all legacy X-ray sources in a hospital, so you could upgrade your existing X-ray if you wanted to, and full compatibility with any legacy X-ray techniques, the KV, MA, or grid, grid on or grid off, it doesn't matter, you can use it. Now, what sets apart the single exposure dual energy technology and how does it work in practice? Very simply, um, motion artifacts, which is something we mentioned earlier, these are solutions that are out today available. And you can see every one of them has motion artifacts, but the single exposure solution, of course, has no motion artifact. So image quality is a big deal. Number two, you can finally take laterals with dual energy, something that was not possible previously. Not only can you take laterals, you could also take APs, extremities, obliques, PA, pretty much everything that you do with your X ray can now be done with dual energy. And the laterals give you additional information in the retrocardiac space that was not available previously. So what's the impact of such a solution on healthcare stakeholders? We can divide this into four categories. For the administrator, you're looking at time savings because you're going to get early detection. You're leveraging your existing X-ray equipment, infrastructure, training, clinical techniques, right? So it, it, it saves time and the adoption is easy and it benefits patients across multiple departments, radiology, ICU, CCU, ER, OR, and so forth. For the clinician, the benefits are primarily increased confidence, increased inter-reader agreements, even those between, uh, between those of different skill levels, so you don't have to go back and change a clinical diagnosis, incidental findings, which can be beneficial, especially for follow-on um, procedures, Optimized use of follow-on imaging modalities and a reduction in reading time. It's counterintuitive to say this, but, uh, but actually practical experience shows that reading three images is faster than reading one image. The main reason for this is the hard cases that take you minutes to read can now be done in seconds. For the technologist, it's, it's, it's very easy adoption. It's fully integrated with PACS, same procedure and dose as a chest X-ray. It's portable, so you're not moving patients around unnecessarily in the hospital. This can be useful for a number of reasons. COVID, of course, was infectious, <clears throat> but also some patients are not ambulatory, and so moving them presents a risk for falls. And then lastly, of course, for patients, it's early detection, and it's using additional x-rays. So it's using regular x-rays, so there's no additional dose or procedure required. So there's some references here that uh, to, to each of the points that I talked about, including portability, change in clinical, and there's a lot of publications and a lot of literature out there. Please contact us if you have uh, any interest in this. And I'm going to pass it off to Jay now, who's going to talk us through the clinical benefits that dual energy can provide to imaging departments. Thanks, Kareem. Uh, yeah, as uh, Kareem and uh, Lina mentioned, my name's Jay, and I'm the clinical uh, application specialist uh, for this technology. Uh, so I'll be talking about some of the clinical benefits uh, in terms of uh, pictures and otherwise that uh, single exposure dual energy can uh, provide to not only the imaging department itself, but how that maybe translates uh, outward to the hospital as a whole. Uh, 
uh, so as Kareem mentioned, uh, this is it's a fully portable solution. So in essence, anywhere you can bring the detector itself and a source, um, you can bring spectral DR technology uh, imaging. So the, the number one place you're going to use that, of course, is at the bedside. And it's not limited to just chests. Uh, it also uh, can produce really nice images of, uh, of orthopedics as well. So you're not just limited to using it uh, for portable chest x-rays. You can also use it for portable orthopedic cases. Uh, whereas Kareem mentioned, the patient either can't uh, come to the department or just presents too much of a risk to, uh, to bring them. Uh, next slide. Uh, yes, so it, it's great for all of the anatomical areas in the body and can be used for all the currently um, in place protocols, these legacy protocols that exist uh, in the department. And it gives the readers benefit uh, of this extra image data, of course, at no extra cost. Uh, so no extra dosage, uh, no extra time penalty, uh, nor any extra time to uh, to read these images. So as, as Kareem said, there's with experienced readers, uh, actually a 30% reduction in reading time. And some of our own studies indicate that for completely uh, non-experienced readers, that is a radiologist who literally is seeing it for the first time, uh, they can read it in just the same time as uh, as they would regular uh, DR X-ray cases. So there's no extra uh, time penalty on both ends. That's for both the technologist creating the images and also the um, the reader uh, making the diagnosis, the radiology or uh, clinician, whatever the the case may be. Uh, next slide. So if there were por uh, four uh, portable use cases that uh, would stand out and we can make the uh, the biggest difference in, uh, those would be the four we see here. So line and tube placement, form bodies, pneumonias, and pneumothoraces. Uh, line and tube placement, it's really hard um, to verify the, the tips of uh, lines and that they're in the proper place. Uh, these are almost exclusively done on a, on a portable basis. Um, and and pick and ng lines are they're very tough to see uh the ends of on these portable exams so when you can help uh the uh intensivists or the clinician on site um see them but not only see them better but see them on the, the screen in the room at the time of uh of imaging you're saving uh, having to wait for the radiologist to to make a call there everybody wins uh, the patient and the clinician also uh, avoids malpractice Foreign bodies, uh, we'll see an example of whether they're left in there uh, by accident through a surgical procedure, uh, ingested or through uh, some you know, traumatic accident. Uh, there's many cases where uh, we'll see how these foreign bodies really do stand out uh, quite nicely. Pneumonia, uh, of course, is very important. It's the number one um, hospital uh, acquired um, malady. So if you can reduce it, um, by diagnosing a quicker in the population and also you know reducing the amount of of, of um, places you bring these uh, ill patients around the hospital uh, you're really going to make a dent in a very uh, large issue and finally pneumothorax uh, at first may seem um, you know fairly innocent but it's one of those things that um, often happens in the night you know someone will lie down and find they can't breathe um, and can indeed be very lethal if uh, if undetected and untreated. So if you can help uh, diagnose these um, on the spot uh, in the ER, uh, maybe by a non-trained radiologist, um, you'll you'll really uh, help um, not only not only that case, but you'll help free up um, you know other modalities that would have otherwise be used to uh, to diagnose this pneumothorax, like a CT, for example. Uh, and some additional uses, not in the sense for more um, for portable use, but just overall in general radiography. We've seen that solitary pulmonary nodules, of course, um, a very deadly lung cancer is the number one killer worldwide. Uh, this spectral DR technology actually offers an increase in sensitivity by one third for these really small nodules uh, that are hard to see. And of course, uh, at a point where if you can see them, the patient's going to be much better off. Earlier is better, of, of course. 
uh, coronary calcium, some really interesting preliminary data there that shows um, a, a properly trained uh, radiologist using a spectral DR image of um, the calcium, the bone tuned image, uh, will actually produce a calcium score that's very strongly correlated with uh, that uh, given in a CT agate stone uh, rating. So if you can free up the CT machine uh, and alleviate some of the burden from having it to be used to diagnose these coronary calcium scores, um, you can really uh, free it up for, for more urgent cases. And of course, tuberculosis uh, varies in prevalence uh, around the world. It's, uh, it really is, um, it is a problem and that 1.5 million people actually die annually from, from tuberculosis. So being that you can actually diagnose it uh, up to 30% easier, with spectral DR, um, that leads to some really promising um, so outcomes that that could be realized there with just the simple adoption of this in uh, in areas of the world where tuberculosis really is uh, is quite a problem. So, what do the images uh, look like? We've talked about the uh, science, the benefits. Uh, kind of the last piece of the puzzle is uh, is always. Um, showing the images and, and talking about how they um, help the specific patients. So in this case, we put a radiologist to the test uh, with just the DRX ray, and actually the radiologist called this uh, image normal. It was an image of a 51-year-old uh, leukemia patient uh, and was read as normal. But right afterwards, we actually gave the radiologist these two extra images, uh, the soft tissue image and the bone image that, of course, again, produced at no extra cost. Uh, and the radiologist changed their diagnosis totally. They said uh, they, they did a complete 180 and, um, and totally changed their opinion in that they noticed a focal opacity uh, indicating pneumonia that uh, was actually hiding behind the end of the uh, the external portacat device there. Um, so the radiologist kind of explained to us that when you have something like that hanging outside, th their eye kind of discounts that area and doesn't pay a lot of attention reading it because it's in a sense non-diagnostic. There is uh, an artifact uh, there. But when you can remove that, you'll see a lot of things hiding uh, behind other anatomy and devices, as was the case in this uh, particular patient. Uh, so if it weren't for these extra two images, this patient would have gone on uh, with this untreated. Uh, next slide. Uh, fungal pneumonia, again, uh, we saw um, in a number of cases how the radiologist would change their opinion in terms of what's there, but also reflect uh, a change in their confidence for the better. And this was one of those cases where Again, a leukemia patient uh, was imaged, this time a 74-year-old male. Uh, and the radiologist, the radiologist reading the DR could tell that there was something going on, uh, but really said uh, they weren't sure. They said they thought it was um, fungal pneumonia, but really only placed their confidence at one out of five. But when we gave them the extra two images uh, that were taken, again, no extra dose, uh, they actually placed their confidence uh, in diagnosis at five out of five. So 100% they were sure uh, that it was left-sided uh, hyalur fungal pneumonia with these other two images. So again, you're not only helping uh, see things that aren't seen on the DR images, you're helping increase the confidence uh, and the assuredness when a diagnosis is made. Uh, line delineation, I indicated how it's Greek for that in a portable uh, situation. And this is one of those cases where uh, the patient actually has um, a couple different lines here. One is a uh, vascular device pick line uh, or power part, as it were, uh, and also a nutrition line. They have an NG tube uh, indwelling here. So that both of those kind of get lost in the DR image when you track them through the mediastinum. Uh, but when you have the bone image at no extra cost, it really boosts uh, with no extra work uh, or adjustment to the contrast or line enhancement uh, algorithm. Uh, really no work as used to produce this image, which shows the, the, the end of the tip really nicely seen uh, in both cases. And not only the tip, but you can both track the uh, both lines through their entirety. Uh, and also take note of the, the detail, the really nice detail seen in the, uh, the vascular stent uh, down there in the uh, 
abdominal area that really is washed out in the DR image. Uh, next slide. Uh, another great case of, uh, of line delineation here, uh, we see a portable uh, image here with um, uh, a patient in a cancer center in the United States. Uh, this image was done uh, just as a general follow-up for, for health and for uh, verification that the line was in the proper place. And again, at, at no extra cost, you really see some really nice high quality images um, that both bring their uh, own distinct yet complementary uh, benefit to this case here. Uh, next case, uh, line delineation. This is similar uh, to the first patient we saw there with the lines, uh, but is a different patient entirely. Um, this patient actually has three lines. And again, they are uh, twisting and winding kind of throughout the patient. We have a power port device here. We have an NG tube. We also have um, a nephrostomy or, or abdominal drainage uh, tube there, each of which uh, get lost to varying degrees in the DR image. Uh, however, uh, without using, again, any sort of uh, line optimization algorithm or a harshening of the contrast, you can really see uh, each of them in their entirety. And again, as luck would have it, this patient also has a mesh stent that uh, shows up really easily uh, in the abdomen, which of course is an area that uh, really isn't nicely seen uh, in a lot of chest x-rays, uh, even more so uh, portable chest x-rays. So the fact that you can see all three lines in their entirety and uh, a lot of nice detail in the abdomen at no extra cost really is going to make a difference, uh, especially in these uh, ICU patients. Uh, this was a particular case that um, we were um, assisting with uh, during a clinical remote uh, imaging session at a uh, Asian hospital. Uh, there was a, a fairly uh, remote hospital with um, uh, an ER doctor who after hours was making all the calls and didn't have a radiologist uh, present. Uh, but in the course of us working with him, he really developed familiarity with the uh, device and actually started um, using, in the case of the chest x-rays, uh, the dual energy images first. He would breeze over the DR uh, image and, and see what he could see in the two uh, dual energy images uh, right off the bat. So this was one of those cases where uh, he did just that on uh, some images taken of a 26-year-old male who presented with uh, upper chest pain. And right off, he saw the the uh, apical left pneumothorax in the soft tissue image. Uh, he went back and looked at the DR image and it's impossible to say, of, of course, um, uh, now that he knew it was there, but he said he probably would have seen it. But uh, the way uh, he put it uh, in, those, in, in his own words were, uh, he, he couldn't help but see it in the soft tissue image and uh, immediately was able to treat the patient um, on the spot there, which is, uh, something that might not be the case in a, in a lot of pneumothora, uh, pneumothorax cases. Uh, next slide. Uh, and just one more case here uh, in a portable image. Uh, it's not just in these uh, nice um, fixed room situations as was seen in previous where you have uh, fixed geometry where these, these cases are, are going to show up. It's also uh, of course, in portable situations, but notice how the pneumothorax really just jumps out that much better in the soft tissue image uh, when the superimposing bone is is removed. It's it's really quite unmistakable and highlighted to uh, a, a much more significant degree than it is in the DR image. Uh, next slide. Uh, it's not just with chests that you see uh, this extra kind of information. There's also a lot of um, improvement that we can offer uh, with this spectral VR technology in terms of impro improving the uh, visualization of uh, bony anatomy in the spine uh, through simply taking away the superimposition of, uh, of lung material. So the, the bone image is just that much more adept at presenting the skeleton uh, that delineates it better than a conventional DR image when you display only the areas of the highest subject density um, you can really see what's going on that much better uh, whether it's healthy or diseased bone. Uh, next case 
this is one of the uh, images that points to the increased degree of uh, ability to see foreign bodies. So uh, this was a, uh, a portable APME uh, that we had imaged on a, uh, on a patient. Uh, you can see some of the clips, uh, the foreign bodies in the DR image, uh, these vascular clips that were put in uh, from uh, harvesting some vasculature for a bypass surgery the patient had. Uh, but it becomes very hard to, to, to count them and to see that. It's quite a good image for seeing the bone and the bony detail. But if you want to see the whole picture, see some of the muscle layers and be able to count all these uh, foreign bodies in there, you can do it actually quite nicely uh, in the bone image as compared to the DR image. Uh, so that that delineation translates not only to metal, uh, but of any number of highly attenuating items, uh, such as metal, ceramics, uh, and even very, very dense plastics. Uh, indeterminant uh, masses are something that uh, come into play and could be really um, uh, there are cases of which could be really augmented uh, in their treatment by what Kareem talked about in the um, in, in the determination of the the not only what's there structurally but what it's composed of um, anatomically and its makeup. Is it is it composed primarily of water, uh, soft tissue, or is it something calcified? Uh, so this was a particular case uh, where we were doing some. Uh, images for uh, the ER in a uh, mid-sized Midwestern U.S. hospital. 67-year-old female patient presented to the ER uh, with shortness of breath and pain in the lower back when she, uh, especially when she took a large breath in. The um, ER doc on duty uh, ordered a two-view chest x-ray, uh, and these are the two DR images. So the uh, the PA was fairly unremarkable. Uh, but in the lateral image, the um, the radiologist that day noticed a very concerning suspicious mass like opacity uh, indicated by the arrow in the lateral view. So his mind uh, began wondering immediately, what is this and what is it composed of? In the next uh, slide here, we'll see uh, how we effectively solve that problem, uh, both for the radiologist and in turn the patient. So the doctor at that day, uh, being that we were on site, he had two extra uh, images uh, to look at at no extra cost, the soft tissue image and the bone image. Uh, when the radiologist looked at these images, he saw that it was actually two different pathologies, um, not two different pathologies, but one pathology overlapping um, kind of a, a normal anatomical area. And what that was, was a bit of pathology in the way of uh, bony degradation and osteophytes in the bone that when the patient turns sideways, overlap with this uh, area in the diaphragm that when all was put together in the DR image looked like it could be a mass. Uh, but being that he had it at his disposal, uh, information regarding the com composition of, of the pathology and what he was actually seeing, uh, he was able to spare the patient a, a chest CT. Uh, the patient went home knowing that they have uh, a relatively uh, non-concerning bony outcropping in their back uh, and did not have a cancerous mass. Uh, one more case here, uh, which points to the uh, soft um, tissue and the bone uh, image having both their complementary values was this case. Again, radiologists read it as normal. Uh, however, when we gave the radiologist the two extra images, they noticed that uh, there was a apical pneumonia on the right side that was hiding behind uh, not only the clavicle but also the upper ribs. But when they could see behind that and see into the lungs, they got the full picture and could actually see uh, a, it was a lung lesion, um, uh, not pneumonia. So far more concerning. And they actually saw an incidental finding there in the bone image uh, in the way of a boulder fracture. So uh, providing critical information about what's going on in terms of this lesion, but the detail offered is such that you're gonna find these incidental findings uh, from the past. And an indeterminate nodule here, uh, this is a really quite simple case uh, in that 
in the DR image, uh, there was a indeterminate nodule. If you look at the middle image there, the soft tissue image, you can't see it at all. If you look at the third image over, you can see it quite nicely. And what that tells you with 100% certainty is that it's not a soft tissue nodule. Uh, it's composed entirely of calcium. Um, so there is another um, uh, aspect going on in this case. When we turn the patient sideways, uh, Kareem pointed to the fact that it's it's absolutely critical that you turn the patient sideways, and spectral DR is the only image that uh, that can do that. Uh, when you turn the patient sideways, you actually see uh, there's this, uh, again, overlapping area of pathology. So in the DR image, we see this concerning mass that uh, actually is two different areas of pathology. Uh, once again, there's two areas overlapping each other, uh, and if you had the power to separate the tissue types in the, their respective windows, uh, you can make the call, and that's exactly uh, what we've been able to do. In this case, uh, the soft tissue image uh, displays a retrocardiac uh, soft tissue mass, and uh, also in the bone uh, image there, you can see uh, spinal degradation. So when those two overlap, you can't tell it really at all what's going on, but when you can separate them out, uh, it actually becomes remarkably easy to tell what's going on. So I'll hand it back to Kareem uh, to talk about some of the economic benefits of the uh, the images seen. Perfect, thank you, Jay. Uh, so I think you've kind of extrapolated some of the interesting use cases for this technology. One of the interesting ones that we looked at was um, enhanced liability avoidance through in-hospital falls. Um, right now, there's about a million patients falling a year in U.S. hospitals, and a third of those falls result in injury, um, and that's a $10 billion cost to the hospitals annually. So if you could reduce fall rate by even 10%, that could yield to the system a savings of like a billion dollars a year. It's a huge deal. The reason why, of course, reveal is important is you don't have to move these ICU patients who are at high risk of falls. You don't have to move them around the hospital for follow-up CT. So we did a small calculation for a mid-sized community hospital. Um, and, and assuming that we could see a 10% reduction in falls due to less movement of these ICU patients, you could look at even for a small hospital, savings of about a million dollars a year. Um, in addition to 31 care days being saved per site. Pneumonia is the other big one. There's a million hospitalizations annually. Um, and again, this was pre-COVID. Uh, and, and with pneumonia, it's interesting. It's a, it leads to a lot of inpatient stays. It's a $10 billion cost to the system. But the most interesting thing is there's a 30-day readmission rate of about 8.8 or 9%. Um, 37% of people in the US who get pneumonia are actually self-insured. So actually it can be a huge cost driver for hospitals. The idea is if you could catch pneumonia early, you might be able to either reduce the stay or avoid um, the stay altogether. So again, we did a small simulation for a mid-sized community hospital. And what we found is that we could um, free up something on the order of 167 days of bed capacity and 42 days of ICU bed capacity. In days of COVID, where hospitals can were, were filling up and they didn't have bed capacity, that would be important. But even at other times, it can be pretty important to keep the beds open for more critical patients. And the last case study we look at is just pneumothorax. There's about 50,000 of these error-induced pneumothoraces in the USA annually. Um, a study that was carried out in dual energy showed that um, dual energy helped improve the detection of small volume pneumothorax, not only for senior radiologists, but also for interns and residents. Um, the best benefits were coming to those with the least skill, um, for example, intensivists or, or residents um, who are training to be intensivists. And as a summary, there's a number of use cases with a number of clinical benefits, but um, this is published in actually radiology management. So if any of you are interested, you can look it up. But on things like nodules, coronary calcium, pneumonia, pneumothorax, there are benefits from additional billings, 
savings and costs due to less non-reimbursed procedures and also obviously malpractice um, savings. So if I was to summarize the economic benefits of adopting dual energy x-ray, the big one is improved quality and risk reduction. You have a potential for reduction in 30-day readmission rates and non-reimbursed procedures. There's also a potential reduction in unnecessary follow-up CT scans. So there's less of a need to move bedridden ICU patients to CT and for a potential for CT wait time reductions, especially in busy eMERGE centers. There's higher operating efficiencies. There's less staff time required to move patients around the hospital. There's less time required to read challenging portable x-rays and obviously more timely decision-making at point of care by intensivists, for example. And the last piece is there's quite a bit of savings because the costs are similar to x-ray, but you get CT-like advantages. In the future, this type of technology can be used with AI or more importantly, can integrate AI. So you can really see a big improvement in uh, triage capability and also in uh, quality. Um, the other big opportunity for the future is opportunistic coronary calcium detection. Data shows that dual energy can show coronary calcium. And uh, with proper processing, the calcified coronary arteries can be seen not only in the PA image, but also in the lateral images. And these can be correlated to a Gadsden calcium scores from calcium scoring CT. So using a dual energy chest x-ray as a first line imaging tool can help triage coronary disease opportunistically um, as an incidental finding. And that can, of course, help expand the early detection of coronary disease, keep radiation dose low, and enhance patient care. Just to give you some idea of how good the lateral images are at finding coronary calcium, here's an example where you can see the coronary calcium quite clearly in the bone image. It's pretty much invisible in the conventional image, or at least you would have a very hard time picking that up. Not only can you pick up coronary calcium in the lateral images, you can also pick up stents. In this case, you can see stents, but you can also see a little bit of coronary disease right there in the corner. So to summarize, um, single exposure dual energy enables new opportunities for all dated X-ray imaging, more confidence, more accuracy in image interpretation, saving times and benefits for patients in radiology, eMERGE, and critical care. No additional procedures or dose or change in clinical techniques. It's just identical to a chest X-ray and you can leverage your existing X-ray equipment and clinical techniques and benefit from single exposure dual energy. So at this point, uh, we'll, there's quite a few references here that we've uh, relied upon to present some of the data on lung nodules, on coronary calcium, pneumonia, pneumothorax, tuberculosis, falls in hospitals. Um, and at this point, we are near the end. So um, thank you all for listening and we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Kareem and Jane. Yes, we've got time for a couple of questions. First question is, um, how is single exposure dual energy X-ray different from DR X-ray with bone, su bone suppression software? Absolutely. So the biggest difference with single exposure dual energy is you can actually tell the difference between calcium and soft tissue. With bone suppression, it's exactly that. It, it finds the shape of the bone and it suppresses the bone, but it cannot tell you the difference between bone and soft tissue. With the dual energy, you can actually tell the difference between bone and soft tissue. In the bone image, only, only items with calcium will show up. So bones, calcified nodules, calcified arteries, and in the soft tissue, um, all the features with soft tissue show up. Um, for example, cavitations, consolidation, um, opacities, so on and so forth. So that's where the real difference comes in. Um, dual energy gives you clinical advantages like CT, whereas bone suppression is really more of a visualization technique. Okay, another question that's come in. Is the workflow altered much with single exposure DA? Or do technologists find it it's a large adjustment. It, the workflow is is literally identical, but I'll let Jay answer because he's been the one who's been installing these units across uh, the country and the world, actually. Yeah. So yeah, to Kareem's um, point, it's it is the same. So it's uh, same in the handling and and placement. 
The detector itself is 14 by 17. It's 15 millimeters thick. So it's very standard uh, in terms of dimension uh, and size. Weight, it places the exact same. Um, what I often say is that you won't know you're working with a different panel until you walk to the monitor and three images come up. So there's, there's not anything extra the technologist has to do in terms of uh, placement or uh, patient engagement or breath hold. It's it's literally um, the same, yeah. Okay, so what what do you think is the biggest drawback to existing DE, uh, and how do you improve on that? So existing DE, of course, requires investment, a large investment in a fixed system, and you have to give the patient two X-ray exposures, which also means you have to violate ALARA, um, the as low as reasonably achievable dose imperative and uh, you have to deal with motion artifacts. With single exposure dual energy, systems are portable, they have no motion artifact, and they are the lowest dose systems available. They can even go lower in radiation than a conventional X-ray detector. Okay, so how do I have to use it? Can I use it just for DR, or do I have to use dual energy every time? You have a choice. Um, in the setup. Of course, the panel always acquires the spectral dual energy information. So you always get dual energy information. However, in the settings, you can suppress the dual energy images. So if you did not want to look at dual energy, you could just get the regular image. So in a sense, it's a user parameter. Jay can perhaps elaborate um, on, on how this is accomplished. Uh, yes, you can. So every Every image uh, is, is the process creates a, two extra dual energy images. Whether those are shown or not uh, can be set up either at the beginning on the initial setup or, or actually at any time if you wish to change them. And you can actually have a mix. So if you wanted, to, uh, for example, to just do DR images of you know, hands and fingers, uh, but for every other body parts, uh, produce the dual energy images, uh, you can do that. You have the, it's really infinite in the, uh, in the toggle, you know, the toggles that you have in, in determining which come out is which, but uh, yes, it's fully come up customizable. The good thing is uh, if you have by mistake uh, an image set to, you know, only produce the DR image, you can actually trigger uh, at any time just by the push of a button the two extra dual energy images. So it's it's not a case of um, them ever being lost or inaccessible. Okay, great. Well, we're coming up to our hour. So thank you so much, Kareem and Jay, for your time today and such a great presentation. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the products they provide to our industry. So please visit kaimaging.com. As promised, the answer to today's trivia question is Abraham Lincoln. Um, uh, quick reminder, you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of this webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one ARRT Category A CE credit by the AHRA, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Please visit icewebinars.live for more details of all our upcoming ICE webinars and complimentary registration. Thank you once again and uh, from everybody here at ICE Magazine and MD Publishing, we hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. Thanks very much. See you all. Bye-bye.